Good evening, and a very warm welcome to this marvellous theatre in the Royal Geographical Society and to a very special event in celebration of the remarkable and energetic life of Doug Scott. The event is called Never Had a Proper Job, and we're going to ask you, invite you all, in fact, to work out what that actually means. So my name is Julie Summers. I'm, uh, I met Doug a long time ago um, because I'd written a story about my great uncle, Sandy Irvin, who was the Undervin of Mallory and Irvin of Everest. And when uh, Doug first met me, he looked at me and he said, did they make it? And I said, I don't think they did. Good, he said, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> a very special welcome this evening to our five members of the panel, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, but a particularly warm welcome to Trish Scott and to Doug's family, to Mr. Gayan Chandra Acharya, the ambassador to Nepal. We're delighted to welcome you here. And to three enormously important people in Doug's life, Patemba Sherpa, who was Sirdar on the 75 expedition to Everest, Ang Ferber, and Marari Gutan, who is the director of Cannes in Nepal. Now, as you've seen from the programme, the shape of this evening is a conversation about Doug for the first half, and then uh, a break and an auction, and we're hoping you're all going to dig deep into your pockets. Rebecca Stevens will encourage you so to do. Um, and then a short film about Doug and some more talk about him. One person who would have loved to have been here this evening and couldn't be is Reinhold Messner, who knew Doug for a very long time, and they were great um, characters together. I think they probably had some differences of opinion, but Reinhold was very keen to send a message, and he recorded this in November, and we'd love to share this with you before we start the conversation. I am not free on the 25th of uh, November because I am on lecture tour in Germany, but anyway, Doug Scott is with me, at least in my mind. He was one of the greatest climbers of the second half of the last century, doing activities between Everest Southwest Face, Ogre, and many, many other peaks, very difficult lines in a clean way, and especially also his philosophy. I am following his uh, thinkings, and I have also a great respect, an infinitive, uh, infinitive respect for the social work he did for the Nepali, especially for the Sherpas. After being one of the greatest climbers, he became like Sir Edmund Hillary, a man with uh, feelings, uh, with respect for the local people, where all we had the opportunity to make our experiences. Wonderful. Now, for this evening, we have an extremely distinguished panel, all of whom knew Doug in one way or another over a long period of their lives. Tut Braithwaite, Paul Braithwaite, who climbed with him um, from about 1967 onwards. Chris Bonington, who I think first met Doug in 1962 on Mont Blanc. Stephen Venables, who's uh, climbed Everest without oxygen, the first Briton so to do in the late 1980s. Leo Holding, who met Doug when he was just 11 years old, and we're going to hear all about that. And Dr. Ro Dr. Rob Lorgi, who is, has got um, inveigled by Doug into working for Community Action Nepal. Um, and all of these wonderful people are going to tell us some of their strong memories about Doug Scott. So I'm just going to take my seat. So, Chris, I'm going to start with you, because you met Doug on the top of Mont Blanc. What was going on? Well, we were a very inadvertent um, meeting, in a way, and I wasn't conscious of who he was at the time. I just actually made the first um, ascent to the central pillar of Freney, which is the big challenge on the south side of Mont Blanc. And so we'd come up over the top, and as we got to the top, we had very little to eat, very little to drink, during that time, and there were a couple of young lads um, on the top, and they very kind, one of them very kindly offered us a drink and his sandwich. Oh. And <laughs> it was only much, much later 
that I, I realized that that was a young Doug Scott. And then, of course, I got to know him over the years, often stayed in his house in Nottingham when I was on my lecture tours. And uh, so I saw him regularly over the years as he developed. And you became very great friends. And... Well, we became a, very great friends and, of course, had some of our biggest epics together, yeah. particularly on the ogre. Well, we're going to put you on the ogre in a moment, but it was the 1975 expedition to the southwest face, west face of Everest, which you led, that Paul Braithwaite was on as well, Tuck was on as well, um, where Doug became world famous because he became the first Briton to stand on the summit of Everest. Um, what was, can you remember anything about why that was such a, a wonderful expedition? It was, well, it was an expedition that, I mean, we th it was a big expedition and we th felt we could throw the book at it actually because it had kind of stopped so many other people before. Um, so it was a siege style expedition. Everyone had their go at it. Um, and so, yeah, he took, he took a really active part in it. Um, and Paul, you were on that expedition. What was yes, the sort of. Contrary to what Chris says, he took a large part of it, <laughs> both on the mountain and planning it. And, and without trying to be too part, he was a fantastic leader and organised all these climbers, quite rebellious lot, into some form or shape and, and did what? a splendid job. Rebellious? Yeah, we were all a bit rebellious in those days. That's does what that, made us. Does that ring a bell with you? <laughs> Yeah. So, so you started climbing with, with Doug, what? In Not really. I started climbing with Doug. I met him quite by chance at a club dinner. I used to have lots of club dinners in those days when the winter, in the winter season. They're usually very boozy affairs and a lot of, uh, a lot of sleeping over, hangovers in the morning. And I met Doug at one of these dinners, really, and we almost got to fisticuffs, really, <laughs> because I was with a, a bunch of tough Lancastrians who their, their idea of a good Saturday night out after climbing was fish and chips and a few pints and a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the standard de rigueur for the period. Yes, yeah, 60s. 60s. So I, wasn't, I was OK at the climbing. I loved the fish and chips and I drank, but I wasn't very good at the fighting bit. <laughs> but, uh, but it was the times, and Doug was with the NCC. He was a big member of the Nottingham Climbers Club, which were a great bunch of guys, you know, and girls. And... Um, very predominantly a male thing in those days. But they were a good lot, and, and Doug was definitely their leader, spiritual leader, really. And after that, we kept bumping into them um, on crags. You know, and We hadn't realised how big they were until daylight came and we sobered up. But they were a good bunch, and, and Doug and I just got to know each other a bit. And I hadn't climbed with him much before, but I was climbing a lot and got to a good standard in the mountains. And uh, I got a phone call one day, um, from Doug, um, maybe a letter or something, but he said that it went this sort of way. Was uh, I'm off to we're off to Baffin Island next next month, um, and I'm sure you want to come. So I bought the tickets, and we'll see you at such and such a place. <laughs> By the way, you owe me seven hundred quid. <laughs> so that is absolutely true. It is true. So you know, Doug was that sort of person. You know. So, of course, I went on the trip, and it was a wonderful experience with good friends and good climbing. A memorable trip, really, if I remember. So, you mentioned his philosophy, and, and Reinhold um, talked about that as well. He had a real affinity, didn't he? Yes, he did, yeah. I think with Doug, whenever... I went on lots of trips with Doug, all, all over the world, really, and um, on a regular basis. And we're, it was always... It was very seldom a dull moment with Doug Scott, I'll tell you now. And so there's always something happening, and if it wasn't, he'd make it happen. <coughs> but one of the things he, I took note with Doug, wherever we went, he had, a, he had a, a soft spot, and he won over the local people, you know, quite just by chatting about ordinary things, like families and relationships and children and how difficult they could be. And he won people's hearts over with that sort of philosophy. And he was certainly very good at it. And within no time at all, the sort of, the, the, you know, the sort of, the most difficult liaison officer would be would be melted by Doug's personal uh, approach to it. You know, he was a he was a, he was a good man. He was a good man. Rob, does that ring a bell with you? It does. And uh, if I can tell you how I was first roped into uh, Can, it's rather similar to Tat's story about going to Baffin Island. We met on a plane. I'd been to base camp and Everest, and Doug had been climbing in uh, Tibet. We met on the plane coming back. And Doug said, oh, can you go next week? We need a doctor to go on one of our trips, Rob. 
And I said, well, I've got a day job, Doug. I can't just drop everything and go again. I'd love to. And he then came back to me and he said, well, what about doing some work in Nepal with the Nepalis? Would you like to do that? And I said, oh, yeah, sounds interesting. Thinking sometime in the far distant future when I retired, I might do something like that. Um, and he then invited me up to a fundraiser in uh, Shap. And in his after dinner speech on the Saturday, he said, Dr. Rob over there is going to Nepal for six months next year to help set up some <laughs> um, and, and, and you did. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, does any of that ring a bell with you? It certainly does, yes. <laughs> Stephen, what's your, what's your first memory of Doug? Well, I, my first memory of Doug is, I read about these people in magazines. I didn't realize they were actual, real, flesh and blood human beings. And then I, I was at camping in the infamous Snell's Field near Chamonix in 1974. Snell's Field was a bit like a sort of refugee camp for British climbers. Anyway, one summer afternoon, there we all were, sitting around in this grotty field, brewing tea or something. And, and then this car turned up, quite a smart car, and all these people turned out. Uh, and, and he was there, and, and there was another tall, lanky guy who I later realized was, with a very impressive forehead, I, I realized was, was Tut Braithwaite. <laughs> and then there was this huge, powerfully built guy, you know, looking a bit like John Lennon on steroids. And I realized it was Doug Scott himself, and I realized these, these people, they actually exist. It, I was totally sort of starstruck. But did you introduce yourself to them? No, oh God, no, I'd be far too frightened. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what was it about Doug that, that Doug, that as a climber, inspired you? Oh, as a climber? I, well, he, he just went on great adventures, you know, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Turkey, the Himalaya. He just, he just had this amazing sense of adventure. And, and I used to read the pieces he wrote. And it was all about... It, it wasn't about ticking boxes and getting to summits. It was about the experience. It was about going into the unknown. It was about curiosity all the things that, that actually make it mountaineering worthwhile. Fantastic. And Leo, what about you? Because you, you're a generation younger than the rest of us here. Yeah, maybe two, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so... <laughs> Oh, God, good start. Uh, <laughs> well, I grew up just down the road um, from where Trish and Doug now live. Um, and Doug used to live uh, in the Eden Valley, about 30 miles away. And my father is a carpenter. And we started climbing with a gentleman that was a good friend with Tuck called Malcolm Cundy. Some people may remember he was called Pike. He was a friend of my dad's, and he very much mentored my father and I into climbing. My dad wasn't a climber, and if it hadn't been for, for Pike, I definitely wouldn't be sat here right now. And Malcolm Pike was a really good friend of Doug's. So um, just after I climbed the Old Man of Hoy when I was 11 years old, um, <laughs> At the time, I was the youngest to have done it, which was with this guy, Malcolm, and another gentleman called Guy Lee, who is a, a good friend of Tut's and Doug's, did a lot of trips together. Um, we, uh, my dad went to, to do some work on Doug's house. He made him a lot of windows for his property. Um, so I was 11 years old, a little kid, and, uh, and we showed up at this quite impressive semi-rundown um, farm in the middle of nowhere. And... Uh, uh, and, and a bit like you were saying, Stephen, it, it's kind of me and you, your idol. You know, I'd seen all the books, um, and we went to his house. My dad was there to, to measure up, to build, make some windows, and Doug had the most amazing gear room, right? You know, like the, the stuff that you dream of, all the... It was like an outbuilding just full of ice axes and the down suit, that he, the, uh, the pile suit that he'd climbed Everest in and all these amazing bits of kit. It was like an Aladdin's cave, you know, mm -hmm. when you're 11 years old and you've just discovered something that you're extremely passionate about. And I absolutely loved it. And, uh, and he sent us away with a, a lovely little package, some ice axes and some crampons, stuff that my dad still uses, <laughs> amazingly. <laughs> Uh, and he gave me a copy of his book, Himalayan Climber, signed copy, and the other one, uh, which isn't as good, actually, called um, The Big Walls Book, if you remember that one, um, which uh, isn't as glossy and photography-led, but that really inspired me. And, 
in the 20 or 30 years since, um, climbing big walls has been a, a huge part of my life. But I do remember when we went to visit on that occasion, uh, he was about to go to Antarctica on another expedition, and he was stressed out of his mind, and he kept disappearing off um, to check teletext as it was back then, because Antarctic expeditions cost a fortune, and they're all priced in dollars, and he'd raised all the money in pounds, and something was happening with sterling at the time, and, uh, and so he was going to check teletext, and for every like percentage change, it was costing him thousands of pounds, so he was, he was, I remember he was really doing his note. And then here we are 30 years later, and I've got my own gear room, which would rival any in the world. Um, <laughs> and a couple of years ago, I had exactly the same experience organizing a big, expensive Antarctic expedition uh, and, and doing my note with fluctu uh, currency fluctuations. So, yeah. um, so Big expeditions, yes, but also he did love a small expedition. And after the Everest 75 trip, he invited you both to go to Pakistan to go and climb the ogre. Yeah, well, it was, yeah, it was his way, really, of saying thank you for being taken on that expedition. And it certainly was totally different. Um, we didn't even have a cook. <laughs> and uh, the liaison officer took one look at us uh, when we reached Skardu, and said, well, I'll stay here in Skardu <laughs> and leave you to it. And, and then off we went to, to climb the ogre. And um, it was, Doug was just totally in his element there. And then when it ended up as being a, a desperate epic, and of course, Doug, on the, the very first abseil off the top, he, he slipped, he'd, he'd basically, he'd led the last pitch, and had taken his crampons off. And then so just, he was in, just in his boots, and it was practically pitch dark, and he slipped, and he was on the rope, and he did this colossal pendulum across the face, and he kind of got his legs right up, and he used his legs as buffers. And in that process, it probably saved him from worst injuries, but he broke both legs um, just below, the, below his knees. And that meant he had to crawl down the ogre. And he, did, he just never once complained. But more than that, he, he would, would have been very easy to have become a kind of a, a bit of baggage, but he wasn't. He actually was taking an active part in the, in the decision-making process as we, we had this really desperate descent. But... Um, he, rose, he really rose to his own in that. It's I mean, very it, it really was desperate because you then slipped yourself and broke a couple of ribs. So, I mean, it was pain all round, wasn't there? Well, yeah, it was, it was, a, yeah, it was a chaotic expedition. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, my trouble is that I'm, though I've, I'm, I think I'm a good expedition leader, but I'm absent minded and I'm not very practical. And. Um, <laughs> And what, all of which Doug actually was. But anyway, so it, it developed, though, into this extraordinary effort of getting down and getting Doug down and, um, and really kind of belaying him down and everything else. And, of course, we're having to carry all the gear and everything. It was, uh, we went for, what, I think it was six days without anything to eat. And, uh, and, and, and you were on the expedition and you were sort yes, of so watching it from below. Well, I was involved with the expedition. I, Doug, and, Doug and I would set off to do a new route, a different route to these guys, up a rock pillar, quite a steep thing. Um, and we uh, did, a, did a few pitches of it and then the weather turned bad. So we came down the ropes back down to the camp on the glacier. And then we went back up there, you know, keen and enthusiastic. And on the way up, the rope above dislodged a, lo a, a pile of rocks in a chimney in a crack. And uh, I was in the way of those rocks. And uh, they, one of them hit my leg and really did some serious damage, and the other at the back of my neck, the rucksack. So I didn't take any active part. I could hardly walk then. <coughs> Though I did try to uh, go up the way these guys went, but I was in too much pain. So I bailed out, and it was a... It was unpleasant. The end of the ogre trip was quite, quite traumatic, really, to say. We, were you aware of what was going on above? No, we, Nick and I, Nick Escort was with us. Nick had other problems. And uh, we were waiting at base camp. And down at base camp, the weather was good. Um, and um, they didn't turn up on schedule. We roughly 
thought that, you know, we put time scales on things, and uh, they didn't turn up, all of them, Mo, Antoine, Clive Roll, and Doug, and Chris. Though the weather was good at base camp, so we couldn't understand why. You know, the, the bottom half of the mountain we knew well. We could see almost all of the mountain, Nick and I, apart from the summit, a few feet. And we couldn't see any trace of them for days and days and days. And so the reality kicked in. Nick was far more practical than I am or was. And he did his sums and he said, they're not, they're not going to survive this, you know. And so we were convinced that they were dead. Literally convinced. So then we had this awful dilemma of what do we do? You know, it's, they weren't just expedition men. We were all friends and the family were friends. It was all integrated stuff in those days. And so we had to make the difficult decision to cut loose because we'd got the porters coming back up the glacier to carry all the stuff down. We'd got no food to feed them. So we had to make a decision. Do we leave those dead people up there and go down with the porters and uh, break the news? And, and the thing was, how do you break the news? You know, that these people are all dead, missing. You know, Chris, Doug, Clive, Mo, all very good, competent mountaineers and all very you know, respected people in society as well. So it was a difficult time for us, really. But we, we made the decision to do that because we had to. But it was, you know, coming to reality. You see, I, I look at it like this, and, I, and I'm, I'm very careful about what I say about expeditions, because you're in a bubble. You're away from home. You're away from all your own comforts and your own friends, and you're with friends out in a very remote spot, in a bubble. And the bubble is you and that team. So you become more than just a climbing team, you become integrated into the system for a while. And so it was a real psychological problem for Nick and I. And Nick was a very practical-minded guy. Um, th that Realising and coming to terms with the fact that all your friends were dead, you know. And we were convinced, so we set off down the glacier, very low, you know, feeling very low and depressed with the porters. And we got to Ascoli, the village, the first village, and uh, we, we you know, so made some attempt to sort of get some food for us. And uh, Mo Antoine, one of the four that we thought were dead, turned up oh, in the village. They'd, <laughs> he'd sort of real, we'd, we'd stripped everything out. We'd left virtually nothing up there, basic, basic rations, so if they were alive, they would have something to eat. So, as Doug said, he didn't leave much use. <laughs> 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 well, I, I remember when we got, when we got down, and you don't, I'll always remember reading the note you left us. In the unlikely event of your <laughs> ever reading this letter, yes, <laughs> this, note, uh, this is what we've done. Yes. I, and then, of course, Mo went shooting down to catch them up. And there was, there was still pl plenty of food there. So we just sat there and waited until yeah. you arrived. And, um, Nick went back up with the porters, and I headed down, down Valley to set everything up for the evacuation of. We, with Doug, and they, they got down this incredible uh, descent in all sorts of shapes. I was, I, could, I was on a crutch. Nick was at his throat infection. I got back down to Skardu to organize things in Skardu, like getting the flight out. In those days, it was difficult. And I arrived in Skardu, and news came that the helicopter carrying Doug Scott was coming down the valley. So I thought, that's great. I was outside the hospital, and it landed. It sort of flew in hovered about 50 foot from the landing spot and then crashed out of the sky and <laughs> dropped the whole thing on the landing strip completely and utterly, took all the undercarriage out and everything. And uh, there was Doug in there with his, his legs up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he had, you know, he'd used two of his nine That's the only then. time I've ever heard Doug with nothing to say whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> completely exasperated. Chris thought he'd been forgotten there, didn't you, Chris? Because uh, the helicopter didn't come back to take you out. <laughs> well, oh, no, that did, I mean, what happened there was, and I thought, well, the helicopter would be coming straight back to pick me up. And, of course, it never did. And, and we were just sitting there. And eventually, I thought, well, the buggers have just left us. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we started walking out. And, uh, and then, uh, oh, God, we... We went high up this valley, and the helicopter then came back, and it flew all the way back, straight past us, and, uh, and on up to the end of the valley, and was about to turn out, oh my God, it's going to go back again. And we rushed down to the, uh, to the bottom of the valley, 
and as it came up, we, we put out a big cut T-shirts to make a cross and waved and waved. And to our vast relief, it actually landed and picked us up, and that was it. And it was co of course, it was after that trip that he started his humanitarian work, because he realised in Ascoli that there was a 50% child mortality from waterborne diseases, and he, created, he raised funds to build a clean water system there, which has obviously saved a lot of lives in Ascoli. But, but what is so extraordinary is that he just took everything in his stride, yeah, even with two broken legs. Yeah, and we took, he took, A, the, he took that stuff in his stride, but I think the most impressive is what Rob said. He was right from the beginning, he was putting stuff back and incredibly conscious of that, that necessity of doing yeah. that. Did, did that. did that inspire either of you, what, what, Doug, what he gave back as well as, as well as his climbing? Well, in a similar way to these guys we're describing, I've been a trustee of uh, Community Action Nepal for um, over ten, 10 years now from, um, from Doug's request, <laughs> which, which you can't say no to, can you? Uh, so any charitable events I've done in the last 50, 10, 15 years, all the money's gone to, to can. Uh, but to be honest, it makes me feel a bit guilty about how little I do give back when I, I look at it, because um, you know, it's quite difficult to, to, to do that to the extent that Doug did. Um, and Don't worry, there's an eager lot of trustees going to get you getting <laughs> even more now. So. And what about you, Steve? What, Steve, what, about, what else about Doug inspired you? Uh, lots of guilt, too. I, I've put very little back, I'm afraid. Um, what else inspired Doug about me? Oh, I, I think it was, yes, this spirit of adventure. Um, I agree passionately with Doug that, you know, climbing is all about trying to do more with less. I, I was delighted by his ferocious campaigning not uh, to drill holes at every cliff in Europe. Um, although I, I fear that may be a lost battle. Um, and I did once climb with Doug, just once, and, and it was very thrilling. Um, we, there was a, it was called rather grandly a symposium organised by the Alpine Club at Plassey Brennan in North Wales. And it was a, one of those gorgeous, beautiful, clear, awesome days, uh, so early November. And we got up in the morning, Doug and I were both speaking in the afternoon. And it just seemed ridiculous to be sitting inside a dark, stuffy lecture room. So Doug said, hey, you, should we, should we go climbing? So we got in this battered old Volvo, which might have been a cast off from you, Chris, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, we got into this Volvo, drove over uh, the pass, Penny Pass, and, and down to Thlamberis Pass, parked below the Dinas Cromlech, and we went up to do the, 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 one of the most famous climbs in Britain, um, Cenotaph Corner, uh, we first done by Joe Brown. And Doug said, oh, yes, I, I, I did this on my honeymoon. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the last time he'd done it. I'd never done it. And it was sort of tacitly assumed Doug would lead. And he, you know, he was a lot older than me. He led it beautifully. Uh, we got to the top, I followed. And then he said, oh, we could do, do this thing above. And it's, it's a vicious little route, um, the kind of thing that Leo would solo without thinking twice about it. For me, very hard. Grand, called the Grand. Yeah. yeah, the Grand. It's a vicious, it's called an off with crack. If you're not a climber, it means it's a crack that's sort of too, too wide to get anything in, but, 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 um, you, uh, but not narrow enough to get a good, to get, get a good fist jam. Anyway, Doug was going to lead this. It had first been climbed by his great mentor and expedition companion, Don Willens, and, and it had the sort of Don Willens reputation for viciousness. Um, the last kind of thing that a sort of feeble, effete southerner like me wants to be climbing. <laughs> <laughs> so Doug sets off leading, and, and nowadays, in a, in a wide crack, you have things called cams, and you just put these cams in the crack, and, and it's totally safe. Doug, needs to say, didn't have any of the right size. And he said, hey, no problem, youth. This is what we used to do back in the 50s, 60s. And, and he, he picked up this large lump of rhyolite and just sort of stuffed it in the crack with one of his big hands, put a sling around it, clipped the rope in, and off he went. Uh, and, and he said, that's what we always used to do. And he, he led up very powerfully, but he's, he's, he then trod on the chock stone, which promptly flew out of the crack, <laughs> narrowly missing my head. <laughs> Doug carried on regardless, led it with superb ease and confidence, um, and, and then I struggled to follow, follow him up the, the route. But um, it's the one time I climbed with Doug Scott, so I like to think that um, I'll be able to tell that to my grandchildren, should I ever have grandchildren. 
I mean, you, you said he, he climbed with supreme ease and he was so relaxed on the rock and he really moved so beautifully. But what was, what was he like to you as a person? As a person? Um, well, as a youngster, as I said, I was quite in awe of these people. Um, he... Well, I mean, I remember, I remember going to the Alpine Club when he'd just come back from Everest in 75 and, and listening to him talking. And he just seemed big and powerful. And yet he had that sort of genial quality and, and as the others have said, that sort of ability to, to get on with people. And, and later to getting, getting and, to and know And very him. humble as well. Right? And humble, and yes. And, and, yeah. And, and, and I met him once in, in Tibet and, and I was just delighted that he came to talk to us and, as equals. And we'd just been attempting Shishapangma, which is a mountain he'd climbed, and he wanted to hear all about it. So there was no, there was no sort of pulling rank with Doug. I've got a very strong sense of that. Leah, do you too? Because you were a lot younger. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Yeah, one of my younger. few regrets in life is that Doug and I never roped up. Um, Chris and I have several times, um, but it never it just didn't happen. We lived just down the corner, and uh, we never tied in and climbed together. He was a lot older than me, obviously. I did smoke a joint with him, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, and oh, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> but the... Uh, like really, Doug inspired me with his with his climbing days, you know, and the, in that those John Lennon era, um, and not just the big mountains. He's most famous these days in the climbing world for for the big mountain stuff, obviously Everest, and then um, and all on all the, the large Himalayan peaks. But he also did loads of big wall climbing in the early days. Big walls being the tallest cliffs on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, before he got into the big mountains, he was one of the first Britons to climb El Capitan. Mm -hmm which I'm sure you're all familiar with from the free solo film. I think Doug might have, he was, he was, might have been the first, it was early days, wasn't he, it? He was the first guy, I think, first British man to climb the Salathi Wall. Yeah. yeah. Not first Elkapitan, European too, I think. Salathi Wall. Yeah, in, in, which like is on the, in the 60s, which yeah. was, I think he it was 62, with, uh, Peter Harbler. It was later than 62, it was in the 70s. Yeah, it was in the 70s, I remember, and, and the, didn't, Peter Harbler, um, quite intense, Actually, delightful Austrian Who went chap. on to do the first, first oxygen-free oxygen ascent of Everest, of Everest yeah. with Reinhold, before Reinhold soloed it. And I think Peter thought they, they needed salt to avoid getting cramp in, in the heat on this six-day big wall climb and put salt in all the water supply, something about that. <laughs> so they drank salty water all the way up El Capitan, I think. <laughs> Which um, I'm not sure how pleased Doug was about that. <laughs> and then the Baffin Island trips, which... To, you were on, was two of them, wasn't there? True, yes. Uh, they were really different trips, but good, you know, <laughs> and uh, always, yeah, always something unexpected happening. And we, we, the second time we went there, up to Baffin, that was in 73, I was climbing in the Alps a lot, so I just, you know, was, I'd go to the Alps, climb there and go back, go up to Baffin with Doug and then back to the Alps. So it slotted in for me. It got me out of that sort of routine of alpine climbing. But they were always different. And the second time we went to Baffin Island, we climbed lots of routes that were less, less impressive than Asgard, but in incredibly good fun, you know. And we were climbing these things, and I put these little pot, pile of rocks on top of this fairly insignificant rock peak we'd, we climbed a nice little route on. And he said, don't do that, youth. It gives somebody else the pleasure of thinking they're first on top. And that was, that was thoughtful, you know, it was, you know, that was Doug, that was Doug, really. But well, I, those I think... Of you, those of you that don't know, um, you know, Baffin Island is a, is a massive island off the northeast of Canada, up in the Arctic Circle. Mount Asgard is one of the most amazing mountains you can ever imagine. These twin towers, these huge, it looks like a fortress from Lord of the Rings, everything's named from mm. uh, Norse mythology. And... Uh, uh, you know, it, it's on climbers' radars, but these are not, even now, no one knows about Mount Asgard, about Mount Freya, Mount mm -hmm. Thor. Um, and in the 70s, when these guys were there, they were, they were off the map. And uh, there's a really famous photo that Doug took from one of those peaks looking across at Asgard, which is mm -hmm. a really, really beautiful photo that just shows this otherworldly looking mountain. And, and it's called the Scott Route. They, um, we, you, we weren't on that one, were you? The, well, I was on the Asgard route. The, this, this, yeah, yeah this, the first, yeah. yeah. So Pilly, it's, Pilly, yes. it's 4,000 feet long, it's a, and it's a rock climb. You know, it's not an alpine climb. There's, no, there's not really any snow in it. It's just a rock face, 4,000 feet. You know, that's almost the size of 
of Ben Nevis, like chopped in half from sea level. It's just a rock wall. And, it, and I had that photograph as a child and it mm. really inspired me to, you know, just, just the fact that these places even exist. Doug was actually quite a good photographer on the quiet as well. You he know, was, he, he never was. really considered himself a photographer, did he? But, you know, the, as you'll see later, um, he took some of the most iconic photographs in, in British mountaineering history. He, he was also a great penman, wasn't he? He, he wrote really well, oh, and that was something well, that you yes. know we all remember reading. I mean, I remember as a young person reading his yeah. articles yeah. Um, in various magazines, and that was very inspiring. I mean, he's a real polymath. I mean, I say he's a terrific photographer, a great author, um, and incredibly well read. I mean, if you just looked at his bedside table, seeing the range of books he had there, from geography, history, spiritualism, Buddhism, um, and uh, quantum physics. And I remember visiting uh, once when Trish had paid to ha for Doug to have his portrait painted. And he asked Trish to read to him to stop him being bored. And not, he didn't give her a nice novel to read or some poetry or anything. He gave her a book on quantum physics to read to him. <laughs> and uh, Trish was hoping she could read Rum Doodle or something like that to him, which would be amusing. But I think it probably accounts for his sort of expression in that wonderful portrait of his. He, Doug was all of that, what we're talking about. But he also had another ability, which was an ability to be a complete pain in the backside. <laughs> you know, and without any remorse, he would just turn on this other Doug Scott. Uh, and, you know, it was just Doug. He was just loving him to bits for it, but he could be frustrating at times, believe I, me. I have a story. I, I was, uh, when I was chairman of the Mountain Heritage Trust, and I went up to a meeting, and Jerry um, Lovett and I was, was, was staying at, at um, Stuart Hill. And um, we walked into the house, having come up on the train from, from Oxford, and um, Doug turned around and said, it's all in French tonight. He said, no English. And so Trish had got some guests, and so we had to spend the entire evening speaking French. Uh, it was you know, quite a challenge, but he wasn't going to take... He, didn't, he just assumed that we'd cope. And luckily, Jerry spoke good yes, French, yes. and my schoolgirl French came out again. But there was always this assumption with Doug that you could just... Get on with it. You know, don't make a fuss. Just, just do it. His stock phrase was, it's always best to set off, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and did you say, how, how long have you been involved in Cannes? And what was your sort of, what are your well, stories so, from then? Since 1998, so um, 24 years. Gosh. Yeah. Gosh. And it was literally that he said, you know, this guy's going to yeah, the... Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and then I said, what do you want me to do, Doug? Well, you'll work something out, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> He, I, I let Chris go. I've got a story which sums up the era and time climbing with Doug, which is, you know, it sums up how we tackle things. And Doug was always that little bit more, a little bit further. So in 1975, as a preparation for Everest, Chris here organised a trip, sort of a bonding trip for the boys in Chamonix for two weeks just after Christmas. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that. <laughs> Do you? Yes. So we got to, out there, and Doug and I went up into the... We all, you know, travelled out together, and then we went off to climb. And Doug and I went up into the Valley Blanche, which is catching the cable car to the Aigui de Midi in the Valley Blanche, to do a climb on the uh, Mont Blanc de Tackle, uh, uh, ice climb. It hadn't been done at the time, and we... We'd, anyway, the weather started to cloud in. We got up there, and it was by about 8 o'clock in the morning, we decided to choose an alternative route. And the clouds came in thick and fast. So we wandered back up the Valley Blanche and got back under the south face of the Aigui de Midi, which is a steep little 1,500 foot, 2,000 foot maximum granite face, which led to the top of the Aigui de Midi, where the cable car was to go down to Chamonix. And we looked at each other, and we didn't really say much. We just got geared up, just put the gear on. And suddenly we were on the Rebuffet route on on the south face of the Midi. So you did the south face of the Midi uh, with a storm coming in? Oh, wait for on, it. On the way to the cable car yes, station? Yes, on the way. So that's, that was typical of how we thought. Um, and so as I stepped onto the rock, this huge snowflake appeared. It was the size of a... It just completely hadn't seen anything. Soft snow floating down from the skies. And it was just like climbing in, in heaven, I suppose, really. It was all, all surreal, and as the pitch after pitch, the snow got more intense, and the whole of the face, the slightest rigosity that stood out, attracted snow. And we were climbing, still carried on, and 
you know, because we did. And uh, so there was no talk of going down. It just would ruin the day. So we carried on. True enough, the weather got worse. And we didn't say anything. We just carried on pitch after pitch, swing, it, swing leads. And the climbing was fantastically exciting and quite difficult, but very safe. And uh, we never spoke much about it. We just pitch after pitch. And eventually, we finished up in these huge corners uh, at the top, near the top. And it was getting quite serious now because it was getting dark. The weather was worsening, and the wind got up. So I remember climbing up these corners. Really good protection. And, and the spin drift, the wind decided to blow all these tons of snow down these corners. And, and it would blow it down, tip it over the top. And you'd get all this stuff. And then the wind would blow it back up again. So you were sort of climbing in a permanent fuzz of snow. And, and it, we still carried on and on, till eventually we looked at it and we thought, well, it's dark, our head torches are failing. The retreat, we can't risk avalanches on the arete. So we, we were in for a pretty miserable night. We wouldn't have unlikely to perish, but we were in for a very uncomfortable night. So I was leading this other pitch, and I got into this corner and got a belay and brought Doug up to where I was stood, and he, he actually got his axe, as you do, and it's thumped it into the crack above. And it was a huge dong. That's metal. So we cleared it all away, and it was a door, an arch to the, to the tunnels of the Aguida Midi station. <laughs> so, hey, up you, you know, Doug, you can imagine. He started hitting it with his ice axe. <laughs> and I, I'm not the... I said, Doug, why don't we just try the handle first? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is absolutely true. This is times in life with Doug Scott for real. So, so he went, oh, it's not a bad idea. You know. And it was, the weather was bad, so it was... Whoosh, and he opened this door, ee, and this door opened, and there was the tranquility of the tunnels. <laughs> so we, cl we climbed through this thing and fell on the floor. Stood up, shaking ourselves and looking at each other. And by that time, I said to Doug, just open it again, will you? So he went, eh. There was a storm. <laughs> he closed it. What five millimetres of steel does is amazing. He closed it and the storm went bump. And we just lay on the floor laughing in hysterics <laughs> for what seemed like ages of where we were. And we're in these tunnels. And uh, it was like what started off to be a haven suddenly became a prison because we were there for three days. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, with very little stick of salami <laughs> and no gear other than what we were wearing by that time was wet. So we found these old engineering sacks, smelly old oily sacks, and spent three days wrapped in these sacks, <laughs> knowing all the time that this lot were in Chamonix, whining and dining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it didn't add to our dilemma, really. And eventually the lifts opened and we, we, we got down. By that time, the weather had cleared and they all went climbing again. So <laughs> it was just typical of Doug and the typical spending time with him. And, you know, there were good times. Very seldom with Doug, there were bad times. But, he had, you know, it was just another day, another few days with Doug. Chris, do you have any recollection of them disappearing for three days? Were you not a bit worried that your crack climbers had gone off somewhere? You know, I, I've got no recollection of that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you didn't want to admit the guilt. It probably <laughs> is, yeah. All that steak it was all light-hearted because it wasn't critical. It was, in the, it was on the Egri de Midi. It was, you know, it was safe by some standards, but, but it was certainly could have been uncomfortable. It must have been incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> But it's, it also highlights his sense of humour. I mean, he was always yes. amusing, wasn't he? Oh, you, yes. you, know, you never had a trip with Doug without yeah. laughing. Yeah. And I remember once sitting in the garden of the Kathmandu guest house, and there was a young chap, American chap, regaling sort of whoever had listened to him about his four climbs of Everest. Um, and Doug just leaned, leant over to me and in a stage whisper said, Lacks imagination, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you talk to him after you'd done your epic on Everest? Because that was... You, you too had a night out in the very cold. Yeah, well, Doug, Doug kept me alive. I mean, you know, I, I, I ended up bivouacking close to the summit of Everest. And, and I knew, yeah, I knew Doug and Dougal Haston had done the same. And, and um, you know, I thought, well, if, if Doug can do it without snuffing it, I better... I better try and do the same, sort of live up to his example. Yeah, it was it was quite an inspiration. Yeah, the, knowing that, that that it's possible to survive up there. 
Did you, did you talk to him at all before you went on your expedition? Um, no, I don't think so. I hardly knew Doug then. No, but um, he, it was, you know, you, you're aware of what pe people like him have done. Yeah. And strangely, actually strangely, during the night, um, I was hallucinating a lot, the way you do on those occasions. And I was, unlike Doug, I was on my own, so I was particularly vulnerable. And um, people kept coming and going during the night and, and getting in the way and, and disturbing me. And, and, and at one stage, Eric Shipton turned up, famous explorer. <laughs> but also at one stage, and he was trying to warm my hands up, and, and, and he did quite a good job. But also my feet were getting very numb, and I was really worried about them. And, and then um, someone was trying to warm my feet up, and it was Mike Scott, Doug's son, um, who I'd never met, but I was quite convinced Mike Scott was there. There's this sort of weird... Uh, subliminal association with, with, with Doug, I suppose. So he was there in the back of my mind, but, um, but I, I, I didn't know him that well at that stage. <laughs> wonderful. So how did you get to know him better later? Um, I, well, I, quite often at events like this, um, dropping into his house, um, once dropping in to stay with Doug and, Doug and Trish with my son. We'd just been up, up Scarfell. We had a wonderful weekend. And um, we all went off to the cinema with Doug. Um, yeah, and, and I mentioned the time, the one time I went climbing with him. He did invite me to go to Makalu once, and, and I, uh, world's fifth highest mountain, and I really regret I, I couldn't go, and I didn't go. Uh, so I never went on a Doug expedition, which I would have, I think, found both enchanting and, and utterly exasperating, I suspect. Yes. <laughs> is, that, is that a fair comment, enchanting and utterly exasperating on expeditions? I, uh, I should imagine so, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> And Leo, what about you? Because you, you got to know him quite well sort of later on. Yeah, in his, it was kind of, kind of in his later life, really. Um, and my dad, Mark, is, is good friends with Trish and Doug and became their kind of uh, in-house carpenter, really, and has done lots and lots of work, and he knows the boys as well. He's been around their life. Um, but most of the time I spent with Doug was, was more kind of on the charity side with Can and, um, and again, at, at events like this. But it was always a giggle, you know, and... Um, the, the, lots of lots of drinks and laughter, and he liked to be last man standing as well, didn't he, Doug? He was, he was never one to duck off early. <laughs> Did you have that experience with Doug? Often. <laughs> 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 oh, he was so frustrating at times, and he he's just ready to go to bed, and he'd have another plan, you know. <laughs> and the mo another frustrating thing with Doug, you find somewhere to bivouac, which is ideal and enough, ample for the period you expect to be there, 10 hours, 8 hours, whatever. And he was never satisfied. He was always rustling around trying to rearrange things, thinking it'd be better on that rock rather than this one, you know. <laughs> and all you want to do is just get through the night and he, hey, just move over a bit, you've just, you know. And it could be, it could be annoying when you're tired, I'll tell you. And uh, it could be annoying when you're not tired as well. <laughs> he's, I want to, I just want to bring up one subject, which I think most of us have had experience of, which was, um, Doug's driving is quite... <laughs> <laughs> well, people said to me, uh, do, you ever, do you ever get sort of fear, uh, frightened on climbing with the lads? You know, I said, very seldom, you know. Occasionally you, you hit a spot where you do get a little bit aware of the danger and sure, you do feel frightened, if that's the right word. But, you know, true fear is driving with Doug Scott in London <laughs> at five o'clock late for a lecture here. Uh, now that is fear, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know. I can bet that Doug was staying with me after he, well, he'd come down to have an appointment to have his knees replaced. And we were driving back up to Cumbria together. And we were going up the A34 and got into gridlock traffic. And he was in his 4x4 Subaru and suddenly thought, oh, bugger this, Rob. And turned off the road, drove up the bank near a bridge he saw, got onto the road and said, right, here's the map, Rob, find us. Away. <laughs> On the same trip, he was doing 100 miles an hour, suddenly grabbed the wheel with his two knees, got a bottle of water out, opened it, then got a bottle of, uh, a packet of chocolate digestives, and started, I said, Doug, I could open that bottle for you. He said, no worry, I'm in, I'm in control. <laughs> <laughs>
what a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got an, another story about Doug and his, his knees, haven't you? Because there was an episode in hospital which you were telling us about earlier. Oh, yes. We, we had had his one knee replaced in Basingstoke Hospital. And there was a uh, rather aggressive porter who was meant to be taking him to X-ray. And uh, he was being very rude, and Doug started telling him in very fruity language what a bu bully he was. Um, anyway, this chap pressed a button and said, staff abuse, staff abuse, I need help here. Anyway, he got Doug back to the ward eventually, where um, a high-ranking um, army officer had come to visit Doug in full uniform, and Doug said to the porter, I brought in reinforcements. <laughs> 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 oh, one-liners, weren't they? They were superb, you know. Yes, he was very good with the one-liners, wasn't he? Very yes, pithy. very good, yeah. yeah. Can you... Well, another one, which um, probably shouldn't leave these four walls... I'm, is, sure, uh, I'm sure it won't, Rob. We'll, we'll keep it in. ...is when I first introduced him to my now-wife, Chris, he said to me, she's a good one, Rob. Your previous ones were substandard, quite frankly. <laughs> 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 oh God! Fantastic. So, t tell me, tell me a little bit more about his about. We're going to back to climbing away from away from uh, dangerous territory, but um, or rather go back to very dangerous territory. You you said you were very inspired by the fact that he was a pure climber. He was you know, again bolting and and all yeah, of that. Yeah. He was not afraid to take on authority, was he? Absolutely. You know, God, I wish I could come up with one-liners like that. <laughs> he was a master. Yeah, I think it was the fact that. Um, for him, it was all about the spirit of adventure. And, and if you're looking at, you know, this crazy pursuit that we, that we indulge in, um, which is completely pointless, I sort of feel if you're going to do something completely pointless, you might as well do it in the best possible way you can. And I think he, he epitomized that. And, and um, it was the fact that he had this curiosity, always to see. It seems to me that Doug survived a bivouac close to the summit of Everest, and for him, that opened doors, doors of possibility. And then he went and climbed Kanchenjunga by a hard new route without oxygen with a team of just four climbers with Joe Tasker and Peter Bourbon and Georges Bettenborg. And, and so always he was looking at future possibilities and, 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 and there was always that element of uncertainty. We'll go and tackle this thing. I don't know if we're going to get up it, but let's, let's give it a go. Um, and I think that's, that was what was really you know, inspirational. Yeah, let's give it a go. That's very powerful, isn't it? I had a funny it? scene with Doug and Trish. We were invited to the Himalayan Club. Was it the 100th anniversary? Or was it was the 100th anniversary of the Himalayan Club in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Not that long ago, three or four years ago. And um, there were, I was a guest speaker, so was Doug. There was a couple of other people. And there was these twin sisters, Indian girls, um, uh, Nungshi and Tashi. Uh, really beautiful 25-year-old girls that had done the seven summits and the North Pole and South Pole last degree, which is what Doug uh, very kind of, in quite a derogatory way, calls high-altitude tourism. Um, I think he was the one who coined that phrase, um, which, to be fair, it is. You know, it's maybe tourist is a slightly harsh way of putting it, but, you know, the modern scene on the seven summits uh, and Everest being pretty much the worst, is not climbing or mountaineering as... It's not, you know, it's, it's a different thing. It's this weird um, form of tourism where people pay and the Nepalese do all the work and you get taken up, people with very limited experience. It's, it's, a, it's a weird scene, and it's a scene. It's, uh, there's a whole world of it. It's a large economic drive. It's not all bad, um, and we're not here to have that conversation, but I think it is fair to call it high altitude tourism. And, then, and it's the same on the Seven Summits, the highest mountain on each continent. And then there's this North Pole and South Pole thing where they fly to the last degree, which is you know, not a, a, a degree of latitude, so you're like 100 miles away, so you only have to be Scott of the Antarctic for a week, but you still get the tick. It's so ridiculously contrived. Um, but it's the thing, and there's a lot of people who are into it. It's a multi-million pound industry, and uh, you know they call it the Grand Slam, don't they? Yeah. Um, anyway, there's, these two girls have done the Grand Slam, and Doug was one of the few people I've ever met who, in a situation like this, with guests of honour, wouldn't be afraid to say that, um, and you know, basically call bullshit, and <laughs> which. Um, 
which he was going to do, and he'd do it politely. You know, he wouldn't be rude to these charming young ladies, but he, he was going to, you know, basically give the high altitude tourist spiel and uh, and and ask them why. And it, you know, it was kind of not really what the Himalayan club's all about. Anyway, I'd I'd read the brochure and done my background, and these two girls were from Uttar Pradesh, where female infanticide is still a real problem. It's something like one in seven baby girls are murdered um, because they're girls. And their whole thing about the Seven Summits, their message was um, that girls can do it too. Um, their, their father was a military man and had really championed it. And, um, and it was like the best message ever. And I told Doug, I was like, Doug, you realize what they're doing? And he went, ah, oh, thanks, youth. Well, maybe not mention the high altitude tourism, eh? <laughs> <laughs> But I love that because he, he, would, he would have seen the compassionate side of that, wouldn't it? it would absolutely yeah, would have appealed to him. <laughs> Chris. Doug. You two, there's that wonderful photograph of you two on Shepherd's Crag in the Lake District when you, you were sitting together with your, with your ropes around your shoulders. You, you go back such a long way, the two of you. There was a lot of friendship there, wasn't there? And a lot yeah, of history. The, yeah, the inter I think that... It's a lovely photograph, that, and it was, it was a commercial thing. They wanted a, I forget what, what an advertisement it was for, but we actually thought we would grab a climb, and I think the, the, that picture summed up the happiness that we had at just having done a fun, pleasant climb on Shepherd's Crag. We got up there, and we forgot all about the photographer, and I think that, that, that was, I think that summed up, actually, a, our friendship. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a friendship of over, over 50 years. Over, over a long, long period of time. And, and once again, you know, we were very, very different in personality. And I, I was, you know, even in climbing politics, I, I was always the kind of pragmatic, concessionary kind of person. And Doug, you know, when there's a big row between the, about the British Mountaineering Council and there's a vote of no confidence in it. And... Um, I was on the other side, but Doug and I, we never let our, our differences of opinion get in the way of a friendship. And it was, it was a hugely creative partnership. I mean, you climbed with him for a long time in the Himalaya, didn't you? He was well, a... oh, oh, yeah, I mean, some, a lot of my hardest climbs were with mm. Doug. And, uh, and he was a very, very good team member as well, mm. within a team and within an expedition. And even on a, a large expedition, which, you know, was not the kind of thing he, he enjoyed doing, but he, he got stuck in and he was, you know, he was an, an active, useful member right the way through. Yeah. And also gave me a huge amount of support. Yeah. We're going to talk, I just want to go back a little bit to Everest because it was such an important climb for him. And, and Steve, you've mentioned it as being inspirational. That's how you, one of the ways you survived um, your, your bivouac. Ta you were... Climbing, you were, you were cutting through the yellow band, weren't you, in order to... The rock band. Yeah, rock band. Yes, yes. yeah. With Nick Escort, I mustn't forget Nick on this, uh, these stories, you know. With Nick Escort, who was you know, a good friend and a very strong, good, competent mountaineer. Yes, and Chris was leading the trip, and it was a, a bit of shuffling around. You were, you were, I was anxious. I mean, I went to the south base of Everest to climb Everest, not to just be a team member, and, and not give it everything I got. So I trained hard before it, and I, put, I was confident and fit as I'd ever been. We were all in our prime, by the way, all of us, you know, in our prime, you know, one way or another, and very fit, confident. The, they've been, Chris and team have been on Everest before. We knew, we knew, or they knew the face. I was a rookie to the whole experience. But Chris, um, Doug, uh, quite rightly, there's a decision here in leadership that Chris was very good at, and particularly on this trip, he was dealing with a lot of very good climbers, to the man, to the person on the trip, all competent, all good. That's why we were there. And um, he had a difficult decision of deciding who, climbs with who. And it, one decision Chris made was the one I would have made myself, had I been leader, was he teamed Doug up with Dougal. They were the strongest on record at the time. They knew the face. They got on together. So he put Doug with Dougal. Unfortunately, he put Nick and I together, which was a good partnership. It really was. Very confident, very comfortable with Nick. And had I been with Doug uh, on that trip, he would have sort of made the decisions, because that's what Doug did. With Nick, it was a joint thing, so I felt more involved, really. 
Um, and so, uh, and, and as, as the trip materialized, you know, on expeditions like these, you make all the plans in the world, but if you're feeling ill, you can't go. So, uh, towards the end, as it tried to mature and get on with the, the progress, I was still feeling good, Nick was feeling good, Doug was feeling good, Dougal. So, it, the team was on it, you know, we were, we were and, I, and I, I remember seeing that face from a distance. First trip, really, to the MLA for me. And I remember seeing that face from distance. And I looked at this team, we were down, somewhere down the valley, of the climbers on, the, on that trip. And I, I thought, if that face is climbable, we're going to do it. And I really believed it, but if it's not climbable, then nobody's going to do it for a long time. And so that's, that's my attitude. And I think that was the attitude of other people as well. I was well. going to say, do you, think, do you think Doug felt the same way Oh, yes. About it? I mean, we chatted around, around this. Doug was a bit more cynical of... Because he was, he'd been on it, he knew the pitfalls of high altitude climbing. I didn't. I was learning. And so, uh, but it was a very positive vibe from all the team, from the top down, really. And, um, and Chris was leading it, he was supporting it, he was, he was everywhere, really. Mm. And um, so when I was asked to team up with Nick to, to have the first go at the rock band, I was somewhat a little bit disappointed, thinking, oh, God, I'd prefer to go to the top. But anyway, that's how it is. We aren't even up the rock band yet. So Nick and I were very organised. Nick was particularly organised. And that's the thing about altitude climbing, is being organised and, and fit and confident. And I remember setting off that morning, feeling very sluggish and heavy. But you just pick up and develop into the day and keep going. And the climbing was technically very difficult. I found, Nick and I found it, the word harassing. We couldn't get any good protection because of the nature of the rock. But we, we plodded on in our way, uh, doing a very good job. And the difficulties, we, we shared the difficulties between us and the stresses and strains. And, but the thing that made it um, uh, psychologically hard and stressful was the fact lack of good protection. Mm. Had one person fallen, we would have taken the other one down with them, for sure. So um, it, climbing with Nick was just inspirational for me. He was, I trusted him, he was confident. And we both did a good job. And what... Chris indicated was um, that we were given three days, our, our, our team, our rotation period, given three days to crack the rock band, then Doug and Doodle would take over a second team, and then we'd fall into the rotor again. But, I mean, it was, you know, your cracking the rock band may, may, meant that they could yes, get to the summit, and it, it yeah, must, have, it, must have felt like a huge achievement when it, it, when it came well, yeah, to be. Yeah, I prefer to go to the top. <laughs> of course, well, uh, so you know, Chris preferred to go to the top, and yeah. it took him a wee while. Well, I think no, but I think with with that, I mean, I spent an immense amount of time thinking out. I knew I, in my the team. I think there are in every team. I mean, I had yeah some of the best climbs in the country without a shadow of doubt. But I think in any team, there's there's one or two who are superstars, and in my team, there's no doubt about it. It was basically um, Doug and Du, who, who were my two superstars. And the others were, were very, very good in support. But then I had the, the thought, well, do I put them together so that you have that incredibly strong first pair, which meant that if they didn't succeed, the second pair trying it were going to be a lot weaker? Or do I divide them and split them up? And uh, and I, f I think I finally there, I actually, I was probably closer uh, to Dougal than I was Doug, by a long way. I'd done a lot with Dougal. And I asked actually Dougal, and I said, well, who would you want to go for the summit with? Mm. If you were going, and he had no hesitation at all and said Doug. And that decided me, so I put them together, go for it. And of course, it worked. That is quite an accolade, isn't it, to be one of the best climbers in the country? I mean, he, he, he was absolutely a superstar. He was, but, yeah, they, they were all very, very good climbers. But they, and they all worked well together as a team. And as, as a leader of that expedition, you've basically... You've, those are the kind of thoughts and doubts and everything else you've got to keep to yourself and you've got to kind of work it out yourself and then make your decisions. Yeah. And I, I had fairly sleepless nights at times. I'm sure you did, absolutely. Can absolutely. I just add to that? Yes. What I was talking about. We climbed through the rock band, which put the expedition on a, on a high footing for success to the summit, but there was still a lot to do. Not as technical, but a lot of work to be put into traversing across the face and up and along the ridge in very deep snow conditions, which are very prone to avalanches. 
So they weren't just given the summit, they earned it. You know, they really did earn it. I don't it. think anybody ever does no, that. No, 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 but very there's crazy, still a lot to do. Yeah. Although we did a lot, there was still a lot to do. Yeah. And, and, and he did it, and he did it, absolutely. Leo, you summited Everest uh, about 10 years ago, is that right? 15. 15, 2007, wasn't it? Oh my goodness gracious me. Um, did you ever talk to Doug about that? Yes, um, we did. We talked about uh, your great uncle a lot. And, uh, you know, the theories, we, we've all got our theories of Mallory and Irvin 1924 expedition. Um, but to be honest, my experience on Everest was much more of the high altitude tourism kind um, than Stevens or, or Doug's. It was in 2007, it was a large commercial expedition. To We shot a movie, we brought 75 kilos of camera equipment to the top. Um, so it just, it wasn't, it was that end of the spectrum, um, which for me was not, you know, this part of the reason I've never been back. It, it's just not. I like the, the stuff that Stephen was describing where, you know, remote adventures, places like Baffin Island or Antarctica, where there are no support, there's no infrastructure, there's no liaison officers, there's no cooks, there's no nothing. Um, there's just you and the crew that you're with. Um, and that's much more kind of my cup of tea. <laughs> I, I love the description of you going into Doug's um, equipment room and seeing the Aladdin's cave, which you, you've now got. Um, I mean, it is, it is a, a child, childhood dream, isn't it, to have oh, a... it's so good, having... <laughs> kit, you know, it's a proper man cave with all the toys that you need to do extraordinary things in extraordinary places. <laughs> yeah. Did you have... Did you the have gizmos. I, I don't have nearly such an enviable gear cupboard. I'm not so good at getting swag. But I do remember <laughs> Tony Howard, who ran a wonderful company called Troll, a mountaineering equipment company. And he was just telling me the other day about Doug, years and years ago. He said every trip, Doug would come around to Troll and he'd go into the warehouse and he'd just go around the shelves. Oh, I have one of them. Oh, that'd be nice. Can I have a couple of them? And just sort of clean out their warehouse. He was a master, master sort of swag collector. Yes, he was. <laughs> I agree. How, how did yes. he finance his expeditions? Like That's that. a question that... <laughs> <laughs> That's the question we all wonder. <laughs> we all wonder that. Doug always had cash. No matter where you were, he always had cash. Cash is king. He's cash is saying. king, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we were on one, one trip to um, Pete Lenin in, in uh, the Pamir, and uh, it was an invitation for... Uh, it was another adventure, you know. I'd been in South America climbing for three or four months or five months, and I got back and Doug rang me or phoned me or whatever. And uh, said, uh, there's a place going free, if you're interested, to join us on a trip to Pete Lenin in the Soviet Union with, uh, through, through an invitation. So I said, yeah, you know, when are we going? He said, we get the train from Nottingham in, uh, to Moscow. <laughs> so we turned up at Nottingham, all with rucksacks. Uh, six tickets, please, to Moscow. You know, <laughs> we, we had to ask it, didn't we? We had to actually ask it. Uh, they were all pre-booked, of course. So we got out to the Pamirs, and this huge... Uh, uh, collection of mountaineers from all over the world were invited. Some good, not some not so good, but all, you know, good, some very famous people there. And uh, we, we, we had to give an give a itinerary of what we wanted to do in this, to these Russian uh, officials. And uh, they said, well, you've got all this side of Mount Lenin to climb on, but you can't, not allowed to go on the other side. It's disputed territory. And Doug said, not allowed. <laughs> Guess where we finished up? <laughs> so we disappeared over this col, the Kalanka Pass. It turned out to be a disaster, really. We got <laughs> the weather the weather was appalling. And and God bless him, Paul Nunn, who was not acclimatizing very well. We had to evacu evacuate Paul. So we were missing from the camp in the valley for quite a while, actually, still in, in full control. And we descended back down the Kalanka Pass. And there was a team of French climbers who we got to know at the camp because the weather had turned good. And as we staggered down the glacier, tired and hungry and frustrated, the French climbers were just setting off on a lovely route. You know, the French, they'd got it right again. You know, God. <laughs> so I said, Doug, those are the French climbers. Those are the French lads over there. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. And he shouted up. I don't know where he shouted up. Excuse my French. Avez vous la direction pour la salle à manger, s'il vous plaît? <laughs> so, have your direction for the cafe or the restaurant. So, I said, 
what did he just say then? You know, he said it's the only bit of French I learned at school use. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the greatest compliment we could have had at that time, this Frenchman shouted down, who we got to know, it's the crazy English hippies, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was being derogatory. We just, it was a joy to be called a famous English hippie <laughs> because we all along there. They were just wonderful times, you know, very spontaneous and great fun. Well, we're going to pause for a break so you can all have a glass of wine. But just before we do, can we have the lights up? And can I please ask our Sherpa guests to stand up? Because we have Patemba Sherpa, who was the Sirdar on the 1975 expedition. We've got Angperwa. <laughs> got Murari there who's busy taking photographs. Yes, we'll, ha we'll have him in the second half, don't okay. you worry. But we, we just want to say how wonderful it is to have you here. Thank you for coming. So please can you um, rejoin us at the appointed time. Somebody's got a programme and will tell me. Is it... We're going to rejoin at uh, 8.45 for a screening of the Community Action the Paul film and then for the auction. And we do hope that you're going to be very, very generous and support Rebecca, who's going to be selling the prints. So thank you all so much. We'll see you in half an hour.
Right, we're just going to take off the second half. Could you all very kindly take your seats, please? Stephen Venables. Could you all very kindly take your seats, please? We need to start for the second half. Right, please, will you all take your seats? Um, just before we start, um, a little pouch has been handed in, and the card appears to belong to a Caroline Bish. So if Caroline Bish is here, we have a little pouch full of cards, very precious. So I'll leave it here, and if you can come forward. I'm very excited to launch the second half of this evening's programme. Um, we're going to start with a screening of a community action Nepal film, followed by the auction. So please sit back and enjoy this short film about Cannes' work. Community Action Nepal is a charity that helps some of the poorest people on the planet. For over two decades, it has been working with communities in the most remote regions of Nepal, helping to build schools, health posts, porter rescue shelters, and providing life-changing access to clean water facilities. Access to good healthcare and education in these regions is often impossible. The health posts and schools are either too far away or the journey is simply too perilous. By supporting the construction of schools, health posts and community buildings in these remote villages, Community Action Nepal is changing the lives of the local people for generations to come. The health posts are stocked with essential equipment, a regular supply of medicines, and full-time qualified nurses and practitioners. As well as delivering medical care to the locals, the nurses also educate people to help them and future generations to live a healthier lifestyle so that they may live a longer and happier life. The schools are designed to ensure that every child can study in a safe, warm and comfortable environment. The schools are staffed with highly qualified teachers and are provided with essential books and equipment. But Cannes' service to these regions goes far beyond health and schooling. What sets them apart from other charities is their dedication to sustainability. Each and every project is specifically designed to utilize and develop the existing skill sets of the local people. This collaboration with the residents promotes a sense of ownership and responsibility as well as sustaining and developing local skills so that they can eventually become totally independent from foreign aid. There are times, of course, when aid is absolutely essential. These areas are notoriously prone to earthquakes, which is why Can is committed to constructing earthquake-resistant buildings in ways that vastly increase their chances of withstanding another tragedy and therefore greatly increasing the chances of survival for their inhabitants. With your support, Community Action Nepal can continue to help the most vulnerable people living in the remotest regions of the Himalaya. Your support will not only save lives, but it will change the lives of some of the poorest people in the world for many years to come.
to ask Rebecca Stevens to come and conduct the auction. So, Rebecca, lovely to have you here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, my job this evening is to persuade you to spend more money than you ever have before on any of these pictures of Doug's and other people's. Um, and there are good reasons for that, I was thinking. Four good reasons. The first is that CAN, Community Action Nepal, is Doug's legacy. And there are very, very many people in this room, climbers, trekkers, who've been to Nepal, some with Doug, who have huge reason to be grateful to the people of Nepal that we're supporting tonight. Um, I don't want to steal anything, but I can't help but say in parentheses, Doug has touched so many lives, and, and mine very directly, in that he recommended Ang Ferber, who is sitting in the front row here, to be the Serdar on our expedition in 1993. <laughs> so it's just wonderful to see you tonight, Ang Ferber, and thank you and your team for making everything possible. <laughs> it's just, just extraordinary. The second reason is that Doug was a very, very unusual, very special human being who devoted years of his life to community action in Nepal. When the earthquake hit, he was about to retire, and instead he got back on the road and I think raised two million pounds, was it, Trish, I think, um, to rebuild everything that had been destroyed in the earthquake. So tonight is our opportunity to make a small contribution by comparison, but a contribution nonetheless. Thirdly, never, ever, ever again is there going to be an occasion when you can buy something on an evening like this in memory of Doug. Tonight or never, this is it. And fourthly, with inflation the way it is. <laughs> I'm not sure I have to finish that sentence, but you know what I was about to say then. So spend. Enjoy, um, and let's get cracking with the pictures. Is anybody going to help me with the order of these pictures? Yes. Oh, great, thank you. Are you going to display them or sort of hold yes. them or just point? I hope that I'm just going to display them. <laughs> okay. So, now the other thing is I left my glasses at home, so I, I borrowed, oh, you did too. <laughs> um, so, um, the first one is Broad Peak, right? Let me see if I can find Broad Peak on here. Uh, Broad Peak, okay, you've got it in a nice order. Right, okay, so this picture of Broad Peak, peak um, summited by Doug, uh, what year was that, in 1983, with Steve Sustard. And it's signed by, um, well, everybody, you can imagine, Kurt Deenberger, Walter Bonatti, uh, Peter Habler, um, Nazir Sabir, Doug himself, and Chris Bonington. All right, so we have a reserve price for this. Um, but I'm going to ask somebody to start, please, at £500. Come on, someone start. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brave start, but I know you're a brave crowd of people. Just while I'm saying that, Nazir Sabir, um, for those of you who, whose knowledge doesn't go that far, and that included me, climbed Broad Beak in 1982 in Alpine style with Reinhold Messner, and then became the first Pakistani climber to summit Mount Everest as well. Um, Doug Scott we know all about, Chris Bonington we know all about, uh, Walter Bonatti, the Italian climber, was a team member in the successful 1954 first ascent of K2, um, and Kurt Deenberger, the Austrian mountaineer, is the only living person to have made first ascents of two 8,000 meter peaks, Broad Peak in 1957 and Dalagiri in 1980. Um, that's not true now, but, um, oh, is it? Maybe, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, he was one of the first to do it. So, don't push me into, ah, oh, thank you so much, 500 pounds. All right, who's going to go for 550? 550, thank you very much. 550, 600 in the next offer. 600 pounds. I'm looking up at the top as well. 600 pounds. We might have to pull back if it doesn't go for more than 600 pounds. 600 pounds, 650 pounds. 650 pounds. 650 pounds. Nope, anybody? 650 pounds, 
One more go. This is a bargain for this guy in the orange shirt. By the way, if you could let us know your name and afterwards come to the front. Oh, we got one here. Where was that? 650 pounds. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. 650, 700 pounds, 700 pounds. It's getting closer. 700 pounds. Anybody? I know you're all just waiting for the next one, but you know, maybe you could take two home with you. 700 pounds, anybody in the room? Thank you very much for my eyes, Julie. 700 pounds, 750 pounds, anybody? 750 pounds. Down here at the front again, 750? 750 pounds, in the middle. Thank you very much. Yep, 800 pounds, 800 pounds. That's fine, yep, 850. <laughs> 850 pounds. In the middle here? 850 pounds? Anybody up at the top, in the balcony? No, 850? Don't wave your brochure like that, or it'll be 900 pounds to you. <laughs> Anybody going for 850 pounds? All right, thank you very much. 800 pounds it is to the man in orange. Thank you very much. Great. All right, so the next one is a, port yep, a portrait shot of Doug himself. All right, this was taken by Chris Bonington, um, taken on the 1975 Everest expedition that we've heard so much about tonight. And the start price for this, I'm going to be brave again and go at 500 pounds. 500 pounds for this portrait picture of Doug on the evening of his memorial. All the money going to Community Action Nepal. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. 500 pounds. Anybody? 550 pounds. 550 pounds. 550 pounds. Thank you very much. 600 pounds. Anybody? 600 pounds. 600 pounds. 600 pounds. 650. Anyone going for 650? 650. Over here on the left. 650. What's happening to you up there in the balcony? Yeah, I can see you probably better than down here. 650, anybody for 650? Was that a movement or just a scratch of the ear? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone going for 650? 650, thank you very much. A new bit of here. 700, who's going for 700? 700, thank you very much. 750? 700, 750 pounds we're looking for now. 750 pounds, 750 pounds, 750 pounds, thank you very much. 800 pounds, thank you very much. 850 pounds. 800, he is real, I promise you. 850 pounds. Anybody going for 850 pounds? 850 pounds? Anybody going for 850 pounds? One more go. All right. Thank you very much. 800 pounds, the man in the blue shirt. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on to the picture uh, of Doug Scott on the summit of Everest, taken in 1975. Um, you don't need reminding, he was the first Briton um, on the summit of Everest. We have Sue Layden here, whose father led the first British expedition in 1953, but as we all know, it was a Kiwi and a Sherpa who actually climbed in 53, making Doug the first Briton to climb in 1975. This picture was famously taken, he asked Dougal Hassan, could you please take it from my mum? Um, the only photograph he really wanted to take on the mountain, thinking of uh, photography rather got in the way, but I'm sure his mum was really delighted with this photograph. Um, so here we are. Um, it's signed by Doug, by Chris, by Tut, and by Reinhold Messner. So we've got all the big names there. We will start, please, at 500 pounds once again. Who would like to go? 500 pounds, lovely, thank you. 550 pounds, 550 pounds, 550, 600 pounds. 600 pounds, 600 pounds, 
600, 650. So, that's okay. Yep, 700 pounds. Anybody going for 700 pounds? 700 pounds. Thank you very much. 750, 750, 750. 750, anybody in the room? 750 pounds. 750 pounds. 750 pounds, thank you very much. 800 pounds, 800 pounds, 850 pounds. Anybody here? 850 pounds, 850. 900 pounds, 900, <laughs> 900 pounds. Anybody going for 900 pounds? 900 pounds, thank you very much. 950, 950. 1,000, anybody going for 1,000 pounds? 1,000 pounds. Iconic picture of Doug, 1,000 pounds. Thank you very much. 1,000 and, well, 1,100. Thank you very much. That's much easier to say. 1,100 pounds. 1,100 pounds. Yes, 1,100 pounds. 1,000, did I miss somebody here? 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds. 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds. Anybody going for 1,300 pounds? 1,300 pounds. Okay, last chance. One more bid, 1,300. Okay, going to the gentleman over here. Thank you very much, 1,200 pounds. <laughs> Yes, I've, I've got all the signatures here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've been pointed out here that not only is this a, a, a print of Everest, but it's signed by the following Everest, 1953 Everest climbers, including Ed Hillary, George Band, Mike Westmacott, George Lowe, Charles Wiley, Alf Gregory, and Michael Ward. That's a pretty good collection. It was painted oddly by a boy that I was at primary school with in Seven Oaks. His name's Graham Lothian, um, and he very kindly donated it. Um, lovely picture, wonderful signatures. Where to start with this one? 500 pounds again. 500 pounds? 500? 600. That was a bit of a jump. Who's going for 700? 700. So it's going to 800, 800, thank you very much. 900 pounds, 900 pounds, going anyone 900 pounds? 900 pounds, thank you very much. 1,000 pounds. <laughs> 1,000 pounds, anybody going for 1,000 pounds? 1,000, thank you very much. 1,100 pounds. 1,100 pounds, 1,100 pounds, 1,200 pounds. Anybody here going for 1,200 pounds for this? 1,200 pounds, thank you very much. 1,300 pounds. Anybody going for 1,300 pounds? Very important signatures. We can't get any more of those, sadly. 1,300 pounds. 1,400 pounds. 1,400 pounds. Thank you very much. 1,400 pounds. New bidder at the back. 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds. Anybody going for 1,500 pounds? 1,500 pounds. Thank you very much. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds, 1,600 pounds, thank you very much. 1,700 pounds, 1,700 pounds. We may have drawn the limit there on one bidder. Are there any others with 1,700 pounds? At the back, maybe, 1,700 pounds. Anybody, 1,700, thank you. 1,700 pounds, fantastic, 1,800 pounds. Anybody for 1,800 pounds? 1,800 pounds. 1,800 pounds, thank you very much, 1,800 pounds. It has sold for more than this before, on well, not such special occasions, just to say, 1,900 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they were, 1,900 pounds. 1,900 pounds, anybody voting 1,900 pounds? 1,900? Do we have to go for 18? Okay, last chance, 1,900. Okay, that's very nice, because I know we're going to meet the magical number of 2,000 pounds. <laughs> Even if I put my hand in my own pocket. 2,000 pounds. 
2,000 pounds. Thank you very much. 2,000, 2,100. 2,100 pounds. 2,100 pounds. Oh! <laughs> I'm so sorry, Loretta. Yes. <laughs> you, please don't do that. Okay, 2,000. So 2,100 pounds. Anybody? 2,100 pounds. 2,100 pounds? Anybody see 2,100? Okay, it is. <laughs> ah, okay, we can wait. Just thinking where to hang it. <laughs> 2,100 pounds. Thank you very much indeed. 2,200 pounds. 2,200 pounds. Two thousand two hundred pounds. Two thousand three 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 hundred pounds. I mean, it might seem not much just putting up your hand, but another hundred pounds stretches a very long way in the Himalayas. Two thousand four hundred pounds. Two thousand four hundred pounds. 2,400 pounds? Anybody else in the room? Okay, thank you very much. Yours, 2,300 pounds. Thank you very much. Okay, another iconic photograph taken by Doug of Dougal Haston climbing the Hillary Step in quite heavy snow conditions. Um, Doug had run out of film, so he had to change the film in his camera. Um, I don't quite know how he did that, actually, uh, just short of 29,000 feet, but that he did to take this picture of um, Dougal Haston on the 1975 Everest expedition. Start again at 500 pounds. 500 pounds, thank you very much. 600 pounds, 600 pounds. Anybody in the room, 600 pounds? 600 pounds, anybody in the room? 600 pounds, thank you very much. 700, anyone for 700 pounds? 700 pounds? 700 pounds. I'm looking around the room at the top. Oh, God, thank you. You should know, it's signed by Ed Hillary. <laughs> I forgot that bit. Um, and, and by Doug Scott. I'm sure that has to add another £100 at least. So, £800. Anybody? £800 in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. £800. £900. Anybody? £900. £900. £900. Thank you very much. £1,000. £1,000. Anybody in the room? £1,000. £1,000. Anybody in the room for 1,000 one of the, one of the back, 1,000, that's lovely. 1,100 pounds, 1,100 pounds. Anybody going for 1,200 pounds? 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds. Anybody in the room, 1,200 pounds. Thank you very much, 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds. 1,300 pounds. Thank you very much indeed. 1,400 pounds. Anybody going for 1,400 pounds? 1,400 pounds at the back there. 1,400, 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds, nice round number. 1,500 pounds? 1,500 pounds. Anybody else? I'm not just looking at you, don't worry. 1,500 pounds. Anybody else in the room? 1,500 pounds? 1,500 pounds? 1,500 pounds. Thank you very much indeed. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds? Sure. <laughs> 1,600 pounds. Anybody? To the lady in blue. Thank you very much indeed. That was 1,500 pounds. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. So, uh, K2, I've got. Yeah, K2. Um, the next photograph, uh, this was Doug saying that he wasn't really a photographer, um, taking the most stunning photograph of K2, of course, the second highest mountain in the world. Um, a mountain that Doug tried to climb four times um, and one of the few that he didn't manage to get to the top, not for the want of a lack of trying, and we know also he will have been doing it by the purest line and the purest style. Um, but he took this picture from Broad Peak um, in 1983, and it is signed by Doug Scott. So, once again, if we can start at 500 pounds. 500 pounds, thank you very much. 600 pounds, anybody in the room? 600 pounds, 600 pounds. Was that a, yes? Wasn't quite clear about that. 500 pounds, was there 600 pounds there? 600 pounds, 600 pounds, thank you very much. 700 pounds, anyone for 700 pounds? 700 pounds. Anyone in the room, 700 pounds for this picture of K2? Stunningly beautiful mountain. Anybody in the room? 700 pounds. Anybody? 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 Remembering the occasion, remembering how 100 pounds, 50 pounds can make all the difference. Yes? <laughs> Is that over the page? Um, are you sure about that? Yeah. You're quite right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It, uh, hold on, let me just see. It, it's, it's signed by yeah, Doug Scott, Chris Wannington, and Reinhold Messner. All right, another hundred pounds for each signature. <laughs> um, so, where were we? 700? We're going to 800. Is that right? 800 pounds for anybody in the room. Reinhold Messer, signature, Chris Bonington, and Doug Scott. Wonderful picture of K2. I mean, you know, just aesthetically, it's a very, very beautiful photograph. 800 pounds. Anyway, 800 pounds. Thank you very much. 900 pounds. Anybody in the room for 900 pounds? 900 pounds for a picture of K2, taken by Doug Scott, signed by Doug Scott, and Chris Bonington, and Reinhold Messner. 900 pounds. Anybody? Yes. Not Oh, you want to have a look at it, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Messner, Reinhold Messner, yeah. Oh, we, it, <laughs> it would be 900 pounds to you. 900 pounds. Anybody going for a thousand? Sorry, I couldn't guarantee that. Anybody going for a thousand? Thousand pounds. Thousand pounds, thank you very much. 1,100 pounds. 1,100 pounds for three. 1,100 pounds, thank you very much. 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds. If you had to think, think of three climbers, who would you think of? You'd think of Doug, Chris, and Mester. So here we go. 1,200 pounds, anybody in this room? Is that 1,200? 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds for anybody? Yes, yes 1,200 pounds, thank you very much. 1,300, 1,300 pounds, 1,300 pounds. <laughs> 1,300 pounds. <laughs> 1,300 pounds. Anybody else interested in the room? 1,400 pounds, thank you very much. Once again, we reached that nice round figure, 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds? Too much. No, surely not. As I say, money today is going to be worth nothing tomorrow. F <laughs> 1,500. Yes? yes? 1,500. 1,600. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds. 1,600 pounds. Anybody else waking up and thinking they want this picture? Hmm? 1,600 pounds. Thank you very much indeed. 1,600 pounds. Yes, 1,600. Yep, we've got that. 1,600. 16. 1,600. Yep, 1,700. Anybody for 1,700? At the moment, 1,600. Anyone go to bed for 1,700 pounds? All right. Are you still thinking? 
<laughs> Don't take too long. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Seventeen hundred pounds. Sixteen fifty is where it stands at the moment. Seventeen hundred pounds. You can't be beaten by fifty quid. <laughs> seventeen hundred pounds. Anyone going seventeen hundred pounds? Yes, seventeen hundred. Was that a yes or no? That's a yes. That's yes, no. Seventeen hundred pounds. Seventeen hundred pounds. No more fifty bids. Eighteen hundred or nothing. No. All right. Thank you very much. That was very tense. Thank you. That's seventeen hundred pounds. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Fabulous. All right. Oh, okay. 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 So this is the last picture. Am I meant to hold it? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is um, this is a picture of Pete Boardman um, and Joe Tasker, uh, whose names people will know from um, the Mountain Book Award, um, who very sadly died on Everest, and here are photographed on Kanchenchunga. Um, one of Doug's finest photographs, uh, with them just pausing on the west ridge below the pinnacles on Kanchenchunga. The last time this point was reached was in 1955, um, on the first ascent of Kanchenjunga uh, with George, Lowe and, uh, George Band and um, Joe Brown. Um, this was only the third attempt of Kanchenjunga, and actually Doug said of all his clients, um, this was one of the hardest and the most rewarding in every way. So here we go, two of the world's, Britain's greatest climbers and the world's indeed. Uh, yeah, it's signed by, yes, it's signed by, <laughs> don't forget, I won't forget, um, by Joe Brown, uh, who made the first ascent with George, uh, George Band, by Doug Scott himself, and by Chris Bonington. And I think that was it. Yes, everybody. So Joe Brown, Doug Scott, and Bonington. Wonderful picture of these two extraordinary climbers on Kanchenjunga. 500 pounds. 500 pounds, this is the last picture, thank you very much. 600 pounds, anybody for six, top, 600 pounds, fantastic, thank you very much. First from up on the balcony, 700 pounds, 700 pounds, 800 pounds, 800 pounds, 900 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 1,100 pounds, 1,100 pounds, Tasker and Boardman on Kanchen Shingo, 1,100 pounds, 1,200 pounds. £1,200. Anybody here in the room for £1,200? Up the top. £1,200? Thank you very much. £1,200. £1,300. £1,300. £1,400. £1,400. Anybody in the room for £1,400? £1,400. Fantastic. Thank you very much. £1,500. £1,500. £1,500. Thank you very much indeed. £1,600. £1,600. 1,600 pounds, 1,600 pounds, thank you very much indeed, 1,700 pounds, 1,700 pounds, anybody 1,700 pounds in this room, 1,700 pounds, 1,800 pounds, 1,800 pounds, 1,900 pounds, a very nice figure, 2,000 pounds, anybody for 2,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds for this wonderful picture of Boardman and Tasker, huge part of British mountaineering history, 2,000 pounds, thank you very much. To 2,000, 2,000 we got here. Was that 2,100? I think that was the 2,000. 2,100, anyone in the room? 2,100 pounds. 2,100 pounds. Up the top. No. Thank you, Tuck. Yeah. <laughs> Tuck just said that Joe Tasker's brother uh, yeah. is in the audience today. 2,000, lost track of time now, was it 2,100? <laughs> 2,100, anybody for 2,100? Okay, any more? This is the last bit. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> All right, okay, that is wonderful. Thank you very much. Going, going, gone.
Um, um, I, I don't know if anybody was totting that up as we were going, but I'm going to guess that was good. <laughs> um, up towards 20,000, I would imagine, probably at least. Yeah, yeah, super. So we'll let you know. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. It's, it's absolutely fabulous that you've been so generous and we've been able to raise money for this wonderful cause. And on that score, Rob, let's talk a little bit about, about, um, about Doug's energy behind it. I mean, what, what inspired him to, to set up Community well, Action Nepal? I mean, huge energy. Um, I'd just like to say that I think I'm going to get Rebecca to sell a flog of some of my family snaps, if that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Doug would have been proud. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, Doug was driven by a, a deep compassion and love for the people of Nepal. And he had, as well as the, the bigger um, effect of can, he has also showed lots of kindness to individuals. And I'll never forget, anybody when traveling with Doug, it was like going with an aging rock star. Um, and I remember once we were walk, trekking back uh, to Kathmandu and came across a honey hunter climbing a cliff with a homemade twine, so incredibly dangerous. And Doug said to him, um, I'll give you one of my old climbing ropes. Anyway, we arrived back in Kathmandu, throngs of people wanting to meet Doug. The first thing he did was to ask somebody to go and get this rope out and take it to this honey hunter. And Trish will remember another trek we were going on, and uh, it was before Doug had had his knees operated on. And we waited and waited and waited, no sign of Doug. He eventually arrived down, he was walking with crutches. The palms of his hands were just two huge blisters. And he had been sitting talking to an elderly lady who had been crocheting hats to see if he could find a market for them for her. So it wasn't just the overall effect of can. It was, it was a deep personal love of the people there that, that drove him. And you said he, he was received like an, an ageing rock star. He was. I mean, yes. and, and people, do people love working with him? Yes, oh yeah, I mean, he can be infuriating. I mean, he could be very infuriating at times. Um, I can see Trish nodding over there. And uh, I remember on one occasion, we, we had gone to visit a site for a potential health post, which has now been built. And the pilot had said, we've got to get back to Kathmandu before five o'clock, otherwise there's going to be a big fine and I'll be in big trouble. And um, anyway, Phil was sent off to collect Doug and nothing happened. And eventually Doug came, rotors whirring before we got on the helicopter. We flew back, got back. To, uh, and it was a very frosty atmosphere on the uh, helicopter. We got back to Kathmandu with three minutes to spare. And Doug said, what was all the fuss about? You know, three minutes, we needn't have hurried. Uh, and Trish then told me it was an, uh, an expression I hadn't heard before, that Doug was due an LIB, a lecture in bed that night. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I think, I think you, you've had an example of, um, of Doug's compassion. Am I on? Yeah. Uh, compassion. Yes. I mean, um, this isn't meant to be a hagiography, but uh, it, I was very moved. Um, I mentioned earlier, actually, we, we had been attempting a mountain called Shishapangma, which is one of the highest peaks in the world. We hadn't got up it, but um, Luke Hughes and I and, and Nigel um, Williams and John Vlasto, we had a good attempt, and we were there with Henry Day, who is here tonight. Anyway, we, we got down to the village of, of Nyalam, and we were utterly exhausted, and, and, um, and it, it was quite late in the evening. And then we heard another team had come back, and they'd been on the northeast ridge of Everest. And in came Stephen Sustad, who's become a good friend, and Nick Kikus, and, uh, and they'd been attempting the northeast ridge of Everest with Doug. This was in the, the autumn of uh, 1987. And then Doug wasn't there, the leader of the expedition. And we said, where's Doug? And then we heard in the big storm that had happened a couple of weeks earlier, uh, there's a very sad incident where there was a, a, a young Sherpa man, I think he was a Sherpa, who'd been, I think, working as cook for the expedition. And he'd been hit by a, a freak avalanche just on the walk up from base camp to the Strongbrook Glacier, and he'd been caught in this avalanche, and he'd been killed. 
buried, and they got him out, but he was dead. And Doug had taken it upon himself to go on a grueling journey all the way back over Friendship Bridge, all the way down to Kathmandu, up to Solo Kumbu, where I think the, the young man lived, to tell his family what had happened, to make sure they had financial recompense and so on. And then late, late that night, he came all the way back up over Friendship Ship Bridge, all the way up to Tibet, and arrived um, at the, the rather grotty CMA hostel we were staying at in Nyalam. And then came and said hello to us and asked how we got on on Shishapangma. So I think that says quite a lot about the man. One of the, uh, I have asked a couple of people if they had any, any questions for us, because I unfortunately we can't open it all to the audience, which is a shame, but one of the questions that uh, my friend Nigel Vardy had was, if you could sum up Doug in one word, here's a challenge, um, how would, what, would, what word would you use? I'm going to start with Tuck, because... Uh, it depends mind. what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> really. But depending on the day... I just say he's a bloody good bloke, you know, and a yeah. pleasure to be around. That's about it. That's yeah. three words. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Have you got a word, or are you just going to agree with Tut? I'd agree with Tut. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Rob? Just in the, uh, well, uh, I'm going to give a longer answer. Um, I remember Chris saying to me on one occasion that immense as Doug's mountaineering feats were, they pale into insignificance compared to his humanitarian work. So he was a great humanitarian, is how I'd sum him up. Yeah. Go on, I'm going to push you into a corner, Leo. Hero. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. We want quickly to go back to Nepal and tell us, tell us how Can has coped with COVID. Well, thanks to Mirari, who needs to stand up again uh, and go over there. Doug was very anxious to ensure that everybody had what they needed. And thanks to Mirari's hard work, when we were struggling with PPE in this country, Mirari had all our staff fully kitted out with PPE and all the things they needed. So I think, Mirari, you've been a hero too. We've also worked in collaboration with the rural municipality and our staff have been helping with test, track and trace and fortunately because of the geography it's a very narrow valleys to get into and there's a checkpoint and so we've had very, very few cases of COVID uh, which has been very good. Yeah. Mm. And just to go back another a few years before mm. that because you had the ghastly earthquake and, and mm. a, lot of, a lot of property was destroyed. Well, virtually all our projects were either destroyed or seriously damaged. And once again, credit to Mirari, and he's in the audience here, Glyn, who is one of our trustees, who is... Oh, you can stand up, Glyn. Yes. Yeah. who was loaned to us by a big engineering firm called WYG at the time, and Glyn was seconded to us, and he, with another team from WYG, built everything back in incredibly rec in record time, made them all seismically resilient, um, and uh, Doug spent, uh, he was up every morning at four or five in the morning, liaising with Murari and Bai in Nepal to see what was needed and how we could deal with it. And as we said, he raised two and a half million pounds in an incredibly short time, aided, I have to say, by Trish. Um, and the two of them just worked tirelessly to raise this money. And it's a real honor to go back there and see all the, all the projects completely rebuilt better. But not only that, he took on fresh projects. And when people got exasperated with Doug and saying, well, look, you know, they've asked for a health post, where are we gonna get the money from? He'd point a finger upwards and say, he will provide. <laughs> and, he, and he usually did, yeah. And so what is, what is the future? I mean, Ken is obviously going to keep going in, in his memory. And well, with well, Trish's that, That's one of the things we, all of the trustees wanted to ensure that does happen. Obviously, 
that none of us have got the fundraising skills that Doug had, but we have now appointed a full-time fundraiser who's due to start early next month, and we're very much hoping that we can carry on with Doug's legacy. That's absolutely, it's really wonderful news. And Chris, you're, you're the patron of... Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you're patron of CAN, aren't you? I am so? indeed, yes. So mm. you're, but are you involved in CAN, Todd? I'm a trustee and have been for 15 years ago. Right. 15 years or so. Yeah. But Trish is also a, mm. a patron. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're trying hard to maintain the, the success of CAN. You know, yeah. there has its difficulties. It has been difficult, but no doubt about it. But we've got a good team. Uh, working um, on the projects. And I'd also like to just comment on John Maguire, who just stepped down as a trustee, has done a terrific job pushing us forward through a very difficult period indeed, and he's done it with panache and style and, and very good uh, performance all round by John. So I'd like to just thank John. <laughs> I think, I think as well that um, there are a load of very, very good charities around and in Nepal, but of all those charities, I think um, there's no doubt about it that CAN is the most effective of the lot. And I think most would agree with that as well. They've done an extraordinary job. And it was all <laughs> Doug's it's, drive. It's, it's Doug, Doug's imagination, isn't it? And his creativity. Doug's drive, creativity and determination, mm. yeah. And it's no um, surprise that CAN in 2018 was awarded the UIAA um, uh, Award for its humanitarian work in Nepal, a Mountain Protection Award. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, on that note, and just a few minutes ahead of schedule, because I want to come back to this afterwards, we're going to now watch a very wonderful interview with Doug, which was uh, filmed a few years ago. And I think everybody who knows it and who knew Doug feels it's the most honest uh, interview he ever gave. It's about 11 minutes, so we're going to ask our wonderful team up there to screen that now, please. I mean, I was never that uh, talented at, at rock climbing. I was sort of good average, uh, but I really did enjoy it. I really enjoyed just doing half a dozen routes on a Saturday, Sunday, um, out in the Peak District, especially on grit. He's sitting there Sunday night on the X2 bus with the, the sort of grit embedded in your hands and the lichen and smelling it and, and the steamy heat on the back of the bus, then eventually get into the whole scene of, pubs and club dinners and it, it uh, was a way of life that I just uh, naturally got into. Everything was done on a uh, shoestring budget, is it was mostly hitchhiking. I mean I didn't get a car till I was about 26. Uh, I mean hitchhiking and Dolomites to, to do the North Faces there and to Norway to do Troll Wall and just natural curiosity took us to places like the Atlas Mountains, uh, Tibesti in Chad, Turkey and Iraq and Hindu Kush and all that. I don't know why I got into big wall rock climbing, mostly. I had this uh, crazy thing about seeking out the biggest overhangs. Uh, well, I could never rationalise the exposure. I always you know, couldn't sleep the night before and didn't feel that happy when I was on it either. But uh, for some reason I kept on pushing, going up things like the scoop in Stranraladale, the big overhang on uh, Chimro Vest and the Dollies. But it all helped to um, enable me to have the technical competence to handle myself on big walls. But then we did push off to the Alps in 61. I think we did nine routes in 12 days. And the last one was at Mont Blanc. And just as we arrived on the summit, all kinds of um, rockets were going off and, and flashes and, and pink uh, uh, smoke was, was let off from these canisters as, as a helicopter arrived. And the next thing, uh, there's, there's Don Willens waddling up in the snow, uh, followed by Chris and they just climbed the, made the first sense of friendly pillar. All the um, fireworks had, be, had been let off because the uh, helicopter people thought it was the French who made the first ascent, uh, Dismazon and Co. But of course, Chris and uh, Don and uh, Ian Clough and the Polish guy had uh, beat them to it. 
in uh, 1970, ending up in um, Yosemite, 38 pitches up the great granite cloud of El Cap was just something I had to do. Peter Harbour and myself made the first non-American, first European ascent of, um, of Salafé Wall. I think we were both intimidated by this huge route, but by taking it one day at a time, we eventually sort of nibbled away at it. And it took about, I think we have four bivouacs. Now, of course, it's climbed in a day regularly. That gave me kind of confidence to, to go off to Baffin and try th routes like um, Asgard, right on the Arctic Circle. And then high up um, on Shivling, and perhaps particularly on the Ogre. I was drawn to Baffin Island. It's just an amazing place. I went there f four times in the 70s altogether. And that actually was sandwiched between two trips to Everest, southwest face. My first one was in 72 spring with the Germans, Don Williams and Hayes McKinnis and myself were invited. And then afterwards, came back again in the autumn on Chris Mollington's first trip to the South of Space. But uh, when I look back on them, actually, it's that Asgard climb that really stands out. I don't know if it's because subsequently went for a third time to the Southwest Face in 75, when actually um, we did it. And that really does stand out because I was just there up, up high with Dougal Haston. And we topped out and uh, had the most amazing uh, a few days then, just uh, beyond the end of the fixed ropes, and all the clouds were forming and billowing out of the valleys down there in Nepal. You just felt you were part of something much bigger than yourself, and it was just amazing. The big problem with um, our trips to Everest, um, well, it became a problem because it was decided to take oxygen, which was reasonable enough at the time. We, to um, stop the camps, uh, you're going to have to have a fixed rope. Fixed ropes put up from the glacier, and in our case, all the way up to Camp 6 and a bit beyond. Uh, and so it's in the last 2,000 feet where the climbing starts to feel like it does everywhere else. When you feel you're out there on a limb going for it, just you and your partner swinging leads. Up to that point, there's no real commitment. You haven't really left the ground because the rope's still, you're still connected to the ground. You sort of brought the ground up with you. That's the problem with those big sea style expeditions. But having said that, uh, on that, those, that particular one that Chris organised, and all of them really, all of us made friends that have lasted to this day. And it wasn't just because it was Everest, it was because we were up there with Dougal, who was at the top of the game and was a, just the perfect partner. We never mixed much so socially, but we did come together because we both wanted to do the same thing. I, I just know I had uh, tremendous respect for him. It was a bit of a doer character. He was very much like a Sherpa, um, completely self-contained and very economical. We never never wasted a step or a breath or, or, or a word for that matter. Just totally reliable and competent and always led his pitch and wasn't the prima donna people used to write about. He took his share with the chores in the camp, you know, putting the brews on and all the rest of it. We don't think we had a hard word at all. There was never a hard word on, on any of our trips together. It was just, um, uh, we were just, just there looking out for each other the whole way. It's a perfect partnership. But it was so sad that um, other plans we'd laid, like him going to Nupsi with us and uh, the Ogre, uh, and, uh, never took place because he was, of course, avalanched on in, in uh, 17th of January, 1977. Gone. Buried under two foot of snow below the Riondas, uh, uh, peak in Lausanne. The main thing from Everest 75, the southwest face, was uh, the bivvy. Being late on the top, we, we didn't um, get down very far. In fact, we only got, went down um, 100 metres vertically from the summit and um, had to bivouac without sleeping bags, no oxygen left. And um, so we dug a snow cave and spent the night in that uh, about nine hours and survived it. Well, that really did widen the range of what and how I might climb in the future. After surviving from not having oxygen, I personally wouldn't, would not need it again. But the first person to actually go up there and not use it was Reinhold and, and Peter. And that was a heck of a breakthrough. And it meant a lot towards um, the furtherance of um, alpine style climbing high up. Reinhold phenomenally strong 
and highly, so highly motivated and experienced, was able to do that supreme thing of climb Everest, uh, completely solo from the north, partly by a new route, with only his pregnant girlfriend in support. I mean, there wasn't even a liaison officer down on the East Rongbuk Glacier. Most of us that um, were going out regularly doing new things were just taking a, a, a little step up you know, on the backs of those that went before. But Reinhold really did take quite a big step, <laughs> quite a leap. I keep reading and hearing that um, climbing has always been super competitive. I, I disagree with that. Um, I would say, as Don Willen said, that there's always been competition, but for the route, not to be better than anyone else particularly. We wanted to get the route done. We would be a bit annoyed if someone else was going to do the route before us, because that's where all the interest is, in going where no one's gone before, you know, looking around the next corner. Like Cicero said in the first century, what's always fascinated man most is the unknown. I tried for four years since Everest to, to go to Canton Junga. It seems we were the first to arrive at this um, north base camp site, uh, Pang Pema, since 1931, since Frank Smythe was, was there with the Swiss. And from then on, it was all kind of exploration. Everything had changed. The glacier had shrunk, and uh, there was avalanches pouring off it. The weather was atrocious. The, the westerners were really hammering the mountain. Uh, it was pretty grim, actually. We sat in this uh, snow cave at 25,500 feet. We were saying, well, what, what are we doing up here exactly? I mean, uh, if we were the last men on the planet, would we be up here doing this? Definitely not. All oh, right, it's all ego, is it? Is it, is it? Are we up here suffering like this because we can't get control of our egos and just want to go home and impress everybody? What if we actually didn't just push that a little bit harder and, and take it to our limit? Wouldn't we be forever sort of dissatisfied? At three in the morning, I woke up completely rested, wide awake, with this certain feeling, like a voice in my chest telling me, we shouldn't be going down any further. Now's the time to go straight back up. And I eventually I pushed the blocks away from the entrance to the cave and it was for the first time a completely windless, starry, early starry morning. The three of us set off and um, had another night out. Up there, uh, without any oxygen on our back, just a butty bag, spare gloves, um, a torch and so on. But, uh, just marvellous to be up there without all that weight. Uh, 28,000 feet, we are going so slowly, just uh, 10 paces, start, breathe heavily for a few minutes and on again. We, uh, we pulled it off uh, against, against all the odds, really. But um, looking back, that was the most demanding climb I ever did. First time a big mountain had been climbed lightweight, without masses of fixed rope, without a lot of Sherpa support. You only tend to talk about your, uh, su your successes, but uh, looking back on my climbing, I've had um, four goes at K2, four goes at Nanga Parba, four goes at Makalu. Never got up. And actually, on, on these um, so-called failures, it's on those that, that um, in, in many cases, more interesting things happen. By definition, you can be on the top without having gone to your limit, but on a failure, you've quite often gone to your limit without uh, actually going to the top and learnt more about yourself. When you are pushing the limits of your endurance, when you are climbing high, it does concentrate your mind. All your life becomes so kind of down to that point, so, so f focused that all the rest of your life is very, very distant. And it does have the effect of, of calming that uh, inner chatter. Why do you bother climbing? Why do you climb? Uh, all I could think of saying was, well, I get grumpy when I don't. <laughs> It's a lovely line. I get grumpy if I don't. That's marvellous, isn't it? Chris, did that bring back some memories, just watching him chatting? I think the whole of tonight, actually, has brought back to me an immense number of memories. And I think as well, I think both members of the audience and us up here, it's brought back to, to us. And it's brought back to me even more intensely of what a very, very special man he was. Mm. 
Oh, well, I, I, you know, I mean, we're sat up here and feel very privileged to be representing people who knew Doug, really, and uh, I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience and around the world would love to remember Doug in a way they could talk freely, openly, as we have been given the chance to tonight about our memories with him. And he's a truly remarkable guy, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say he was a really close and good friend, and I, I'm very pleased to have I'd had that sort of chance to spend time with Doug, really, and a uh, very special person, really, in every way, every sense. Very special. Thank you. Stephen? Um, I, actually, I, I have a friend called Phil Bartlett, who's a climber, known to quite a few people here, and he said the other day something like, um, the very few people I've met in my life are of real stature who changed the world, and Doug was one of them, so... There we are. Leo? I was having this conversation with someone earlier that, um, you know, it, it's sad that Doug was taken too early, wasn't he? he? He deserved another 10 years on this planet. However, he was on borrowed time for at least 40 of them anyway, wasn't he? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, superb. Fair. Rob? Well, I think it's very easy to look at all his achievements, both mountaineering and humanitarian, <laughs> but also forgetting the man he was. He was a wonderful family man. And Martha said to me on one occasion, no matter where Doug was in the world, they were never in any doubt how, much, how loved they were by, by him. And uh, it was a real privilege being with him in his last days and watching the tender care he got from, from Rosie, Martha, Trish, and Ewan and Aaron, and uh, his sense of humour was also great. Uh, Aaron must be immensely strong, because Doug wasn't a small guy, but Aaron would pick him up and lift him into his bed very, very gently, which earned him the sobriquet forklift. <laughs> <laughs> well, to end, um, Trish has asked... Um, John, I'm going to have to make my, my notes. I'm really sorry about this. We're going to have a poem read for us. And it's going to be read by Julian Freeman Atwood. And it's at Trish's request. And I'm going to ask Julian to come up and read for us, please. Um, as with... Uh as Stephen has said, I, I first met Doug in 1987 when we both came off uh, Shisha Pangma um, on um, Henry Day's expedition, and Henry is here tonight. Um, and I was lucky enough to go on four other climbing trips with Doug, which I'm not going to do much to, except to one down in Tierra del Fuego, which was a, a sailing mountaineering trip on a boat belonging to Skip Novak, who is here tonight as well. And it was a very amusing moment when we had been illegally in a fjord north of the Beagle Channel. And um, we had been up on a peak, and Doug had gone down to the fjord before Skip and me. And we heard this helicopter. Uh, uh, Skip and I did this, wum, 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 distantly coming up the fjord. And I thought, oh, God, it's the Chilean. Chileans are going to give us hell for being in this um, fjord. And as we got a bit further down, it got a bit louder, so we thought oh, we were getting worried. Then we looked down to the fjord, and then sitting on a rock in the sunshine, cross-legged, was Doug, chanting his Buddhist, Om Mani Padme Om, Mani Padme Om, Mani Padme Om. That was the helicopter. <laughs> um, uh, Trish has asked me to um, read this poem by Edgar... Uh, Albert Guest uh, called It Couldn't Be Done. To me, it has something of the uh, jaunty uh, of, a, uh, of an Edward Lear poem. I think uh, Doug would have smiled at it. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with the trace of a grin on his face. 
If he worried, he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat, and the first thing we knew he'd begun it with a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start in to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. Julian, that was wonderful and so beautifully read. I think we will all agree that that summed up Doug perfectly. It just remains to me to thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the evening as much as the five of us have, and I hope Trish has enjoyed it and felt it was a tribute to Doug and also to the family of Doug Scott. A very great many thanks have to go to the organisers behind Community Action Nepal and everything that they do, and I hope that you'll think of them in the future and you will come and celebrate uh, Doug's achievements in the future when we try and organise some fundraising events. But for now, with great thanks to Stephen Venables, Leo Holding, Rob Lorje, Chris Bonington and Tut Braithwaite, and a huge thanks to all of you. Good night. <laughs>